Welcome to Product Stories, where we explore how founders build successful software products. This is a podcast about product management, development, remote work, and anything else non-technical as well as technical founders need to know to launch and scale software products. Today's guest is Enzo Avigo. In his previous life, he was a product manager at N26, Zalando, and Intercom. Today, he's the founder of June.so, and he's just completed Y Combinator and raised the seed round. He will share his expert knowledge of product management and how SaaS founders can build better products faster by learning the basics of product management and what the state of effective software development is. Hint, it's not necessarily Scrum. Enzo, welcome to the show. Hey, Victor. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, it's a it's a pleasure. Um, why don't you give people a little uh, background on, on yourself and, and what you've been doing, uh, your previous companies, and uh, how you've you've gotten into product management? Yeah, so actually, it's it's a funny story. Something I heard actually many times is that most of the people that get into product management uh, were not uh, uh, like came came to it from very different paths and journeys, and that was that was my case. So I came. I actually started my uh, career in finance, in trading finance. And after, I think, a year and a half, I decided that I wanted to switch. And there are a couple of components that I wanted to keep. I wanted to, to keep the, the numbers in my job, in my day-to-day job. And I wanted to keep the very fast-paced environment of the trading floor. But I wanted to merge that into um, an environment or uh, an industry that I was more passionate about. And so as, at the time I was reading a lot about tech and you know, all this kind of like founder's biography. And I thought, okay, I, I wanna move into tech, but I wanna kind of apply this, you know, this, this kind of like things I was looking for, I was looking for back then. And um, another thing I was also looking for is to kind of keep a very generalist role. I think there are literally two types of people, the people that like to be very experts on one thing and the people that want to be more horizontal. And I was, I was the latter, I was, I was the second one. So I kind of like look around uh, me, what kind of jobs could do that in the, you know, in the, in the tech world. And actually I had a friend uh, that told me about product management. I bought a, f- a couple of books, uh, met a few other people that were doing this job, asked a few questions and decided to take the leap of faith and, um, you know, started to do this job in a startup in Berlin. And that was almost seven years ago. That's awesome. Uh, I think back then I even, know the head of product uh, of, of N26 back then that, that uh, possibly was a good friend of mine. I don't know when exactly he was there. So um, that that is super interesting because for those who don't know, you, you didn't go too far from finance. N26 is the German unicorn challenger bank um, that's, that's very big locally in town. So it's a very exciting place uh, to work at. And But then you moved on to the other German unicorn, uh, Zalando, and then to Intercom, um, which is also very interesting. Why why leave the um, big unicorn, glaringly you know sparkling startup world? Yeah, I mean that's that's a different topic. I think the the kind of the career in the past and the steps that you take to get somewhere. You know, I think I think what I the the easiest way to picture that is. Um, do you think you can outgrow, like there are literally two types of, of, of setups, either the people outgrow the company and they think they need to move on to grow faster or the company outgrows you, in which case, uh, it's very likely that you're not going to get, you know, the responsibilities you want to get and they need to start recruiting outside, you know, for these kind of responsibilities. And I think in my case, uh, I was kind of like, I was kind of like believing that there was a bigger opportunity for me elsewhere. Um, in N26 was growing very fast and it was very, very successful, but the number of jobs you would have in the product family back then was fairly limited. So, uh, it kind of became, uh, you know, kind of like an option and, uh, and then like kind of like, you know, coincidence, uh, happened and I like met some recruiter who was offering like a very, very, um, um, tempting offer. And I just assumed like, you know what? I'm maybe going to lose a bit of stars on my resume, but at this point of my career, it doesn't matter. I should probably optimize for my learnings. So that was the thing, actually. Actually, all along my short career, I would say, uh, I was always optimizing for learnings, more than you know, prestige and so on. And I never really regretted that. That's, that's very interesting. I, I love that. And now, 
you have then moved on to found June. What is June? Yeah, so, so funny enough, I, I kind of knew that I wanted to start a business when I started doing product management. And this is what I told you when I said I wanted to become a generalist. I wanted to do many things because I knew that later on when I would start my own business, I would need a lot of different skills to, to make it happen. The thing that I didn't know is that actually I was going to face some problems along my journey and that I would then start a, a, a company to basically fix or try to fix these problems, right? So June is basically an answer, a solution to the main problems I've had when I was working for N26 and Zalando and Intercom, which is uh, to basically an easy way to turn data into some insight and then be able, of course, to use this insight to make some ongoing decisions. So June is, is, is simply like kind of like a very lightweight, very easy to use product analytics for uh, you know, founders and early stage uh, companies or non-technical people that wants to self-serve this, you know, these main questions they have. That is very exciting. Um, and one question that I have is because I, I know we've talked before um, that you've both went through Y Combinator and raised funding. So there's obviously, there are two tracks, either you, you bootstrap, a lot of people are in the lifestyle business uh, uh, niche, or you, you go the fundraising route, which also N26, uh, at, sorry, not N26, but Y Combinator is obviously uh, also also a, a path that, that you take when you want to do that. How did you make that decision, frankly? Yeah, no, that's, that's a good one. I think it depends, at the end of the day, it depends a lot on the type of business you want to you build. I think it depends also a little bit on the, on the space, you know, what are the competitors, what are the players out there. In our case, I think my co-founder and I, um, we were quite aligned that we wanted to build a worldwide business. And we were also quite aligned that it was a fairly competitive space. And so in our opinion, the best way to compete in uh, such environments was to raise money to accelerate. Hence the seed round and hence the reason why we're a VC uh, back company. This doesn't mean that we don't fight for our ownership, right? You can be VC backed and you can still own a decent portion of your company. It depends, uh, depends how much you want to raise and what kind of valuation you can, you can have aim for, right? Um, so we kind of really respect the people who are going the other path of, uh, you, you know, being like, uh, uh, self, uh, self-funded. We just think it's a very different journey. Uh, it probably takes a little bit more time and probably the growth is like a little bit more steady and, um, and, you know, and, um, sometimes slower, not necessarily. So we decided to take this path. I think what we've awesome. seen, it's also something we've seen and we've experienced in all the companies we work for. So maybe there is a bit of a, you know, uh, a reproduction schema in this. <laughs> Absolutely. But now let's dive into product management. Uh, for those who don't know, because we have a lot of listeners who are very non-technical founders who've, who've kind of fallen into building a SaaS from the industry that they've been working in and are very new to this entire uh, process, what, what is product management? Good one. Um, so there are many, many, many definitions. I think the easiest one I can think of is a cross-functional position to um, where you're like, you're basically, it's a role. Uh, usually it's a role. It can be also like just a, some kind of, you know, science or art, whatever you call it. And it's usually a place where you are the, you know, the crossing of many, many uh, um, jobs in your company, including development, design, and business. That's the traditional way of picturing it. And what ultimately you're doing is you're the voice of the users. So you're supposed to represent the voice of the users for all these, uh, you know, disciplines. And ultimately what you're, you're meant to do is to solve the most urgent problems for these users. Of course, the, the problems which are aligned with what your company is doing. I think that's the easiest mm -hmm. way to picture it. And there are many, many other ways to, to put that together. But I think if you always remember these things, which is that you're, you know, you're like kind of like, you're not a manager as such, but you're more someone who gathers people around the table to make decisions in the interest of the users. I think you should, you should probably do a good job. Awesome. Awesome. And so, uh, as an, as an example in a bigger company, like, uh, like the ones you, you used to work at, um, 
of course, there's a product manager for even bigger feature sets. You have an entire product team, not the product manager. Um, so what would be the day-to-day -day within a big company that, that you were doing? Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a good question. So it depends it depends a lot on on the company, of course. I can I can speak for for where I've been, and this being said, there are also some trends right now in the market, right? So there are many many companies that start to, um, you know, structure this role in a similar way. So, like if you're like in a software company, uh, and um, and that company has kind of adopted the you know the agile workflows, which is the big dogma for the last twenty years. Uh, then most likely your job as a PM will look uh, into a lot of uh, it will look it will break down into a lot of rituals during the week where you're either in the driver seat or just in the you know collaborator seat where you're going to be expected to drive things are on the roadmap where you're expecting to translate the high level strategy of the company into some items that your you know um, development team is going to ship ultimately you're also expected to uh, be you know the head around the data you're expected to like uh, either collect the data yourself or be the intermediary with like whatever data department you, there is to actually justify whatever prioritization or decisions you want to make you also are going to be some kind of like sparing partner for the designers uh, so that you make sure that they understand you know the pm needs to make sure that the designers understand precisely what needs to be done what is kind of the you know the the main problem that needs to be tackled and uh, most of the time, the PM is also responsible of the timeline, making sure that, you know, whenever a project goes into development, design and production, it doesn't explode. So you're kind of like the, the gatekeeper for, you know, the timeline. So what that means is that you have like tons of meetings uh, all around the week where you need to gather all these people I just mentioned. And you need to make sure that everything moves through some kind of like big funnel of processes where you're either sometime the driver or again, just the attendee. Um, Again, I think something which is really interesting about the title product manager is that you you never really manage. You're not a manager as, as such. You're like more kind of a, a leader, um, if if anything, in a in a team. A lot about uh, prioritization and in things like that. Um, so in the end, what the product manager does is based on the entire input right from stakeholders and users uh helps everybody or makes them himself decisions to build a better product faster is that mm -hmm. what it is yeah totally totally yeah that's that's a good uh, summary and how does a product manager make decisions um what what does a product manager take into account? How does he gather user feedback and things like that? Yeah, so I think traditionally there are three main pillars into the three main inputs or category of inputs for for product teams and product manager to make decisions. One of which uh, is definitely customer feedback. It's the one that you never you can never trade off. Like there is no way you build a successful company without listening to your customers. At the same time the nature of the feedback you're going to get from customers is pretty narrow. They're usually, people are going to usually comment on things you've always already like shipped. They're going to give you some comments on a feature you pushed, or uh, they're going to give you a comment on a new product you could be launching, which is in the realm of the same, you know, kind of space that you're building in. Right. So you want to, you want to rely on this feedback a lot, but also they have some limits. The second source of input is traditionally data. There are things that people will not tell you or things that people are not aware they're thinking. Uh, and this is where you need to observe people's behavior to understand kind of like, you know, what are, what are they trying to do ultimately without, uh, without telling you. It also works at scale, right? Like asking 10,000 users, if you have 10,000 users, what they think about something is probably not doable, right? Data is, is, is scalable, whether it's like analytics or surveys, whatever you can scale, you know, the volume of, of input that you get. So that's the, usually the second pillar. The third pillar is traditionally the strategy. You usually have a vision or a strategy as a company or your team or your group has a strategy. And this is really, really important because uh, ultimately, you know, the users is not always right. There is this very famous quote uh, from uh, Ford, you know, if you ask people what they want, they would tell you more horses. Uh, that's the same with strategy, right? You just want to, you know, where you want to drive ultimately your company, 
what's kind of the vision. And if you have something that you think is like a great achievement for, for the vision, but no one has asked for it, maybe it's a good idea, right? So these are the traditional pillars and, um, and there are many, many more, but I think it's a good start. I've uh, recently read this somewhere on LinkedIn or Facebook. I really unfortunately don't remember who said it, uh, so I can't quote that person directly, but um, this entire quote from Ford, if I were to ask people and listen to them, they would say they want faster horses, um, is really where it says that pro a product manager should ask that question because when people say they want faster horses, you go one level above and you try to understand the problem that's behind why why are people saying they want faster horses and then if you do that on the meta uh on the meta uh, layer then you might actually get to uh -huh, we could build a car that solves your problem way better exactly. exactly that's that's a good one that's a very good one actually it's uh, i think it's called thinking in first principles uh, that's how, you know, Elon Musk thinks, uh, that's, uh, Peter Thiel also methodologies, uh, and, um, and it's actually one of the very, very strong methodologies, uh, that Intercom, the latest company I work for, uh, is using, like every time you have a question or a problem, they urge you to think into first principle, or they urge you to think this, the root of the problem. And, and so, um, yeah, it's something we can talk about uh, maybe later on, but methodologies around how to frame problems and, you know, your development cycles. I think this has a lot to do in, with uh, how you ask the questions and what kind of source of input you're using. So it's it's extremely, extremely relevant, I think. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, how does that, at, at what point, um, because I assume there, there should be a set process, like at, at what point are you asking questions? At what point are you asking questions? At what point, what stages does that uh, ideation or well, coming up with the right roadmap items and then getting towards actual implementation, how is that moving? And maybe how does that differ from a small early stage company? Yeah. So. So let me start with the first question, which is when do you talk to your users or when do you ask questions? I think this is the only process that you do all along the way the, of the process, uh, the product development process. Like whether you're like in a discovery phase, you can ask a lot of questions, right? But you ask them in a very specific way, which is extremely broad. You don't want people to be biased, you know? Uh, or when it's like the later phase where you want to narrow a problem, you may just ask a survey like out of the three problems here, which one is the top one for you? You just want to narrow, you know, a, a top priority. And then uh, when you go into, you know, in the scoping phase where you want to understand precisely which, you know, feature should be part of your solution or which pieces should be part of your solution, you also may, you know, do some kind of high fidelity design and put that into the end of the users, right? And then when you're, when you're live with your solution or just before you go live, you may also put that solution, final solution into the hands of the users to do more some kind of usability testing and you know, ask them whether they really understand the thing that you crafted for them. And then when it's live, you can also do some satisfaction like, okay, now that it's live, you told us you wanted, you, you told us you wanted it like that. Um, are you actually happy with this thing that you're using on an ongoing basis? And so actually talking with your customers is that one thing that you do all along the path. That's probably the only one that you do all along the way. And um, yeah, and to, to answer the second question, which is what's the difference between a later stage company and an early stage? In theory, the more later stage you are, the more resource you have, and the better you should do these you know, discussions all along the way. So in theory, you should be talking to your customers all the time if you're large, if you're small, then well, you're going to do it, but you're probably not going to be able to do usability testing every single time you ship a new feature, right? So it's, it's your call as an early stage startup to decide which conversation you want to prioritize. Well, you, you probably run a lot more on assumptions, right? You don't have that many customers. You probably don't have that many leads even or, or, or contacts. Um, you can't ask about a lot of features. So you're, you're more writing these assumptions. So would you say the vision is just way stronger in an early stage company or way more important? I think it's always important, but I think you're right. I think trusting your gut feeling when you get started is a must, a must have. Like if you just expect your two users 
to be constantly giving you feedback and write about your product when you get started. I think it's, it's, it's wrong. And also, I think it takes a lot of time to take up the ground a product which is appealing or exciting enough in the first months over even sometime the first years that if you exclusively rely on people um yeah it's i think it's less likely that they will tell you how to build something fancy right this is why you know when you get started there's so many people saying like you should uh, solve one of your problem because it's actually if you solve one of your problem it's not that it's kind of like you will be you should be able to listen to yourself every time you have a question since you're one of the users so it's mm -hmm. gonna save you some time on running interviews you can just look at yourself in the mirror and ask yourself mm -hmm. 100 percent. now let's move on a bit on to um software development itself and uh, obviously in, in in smaller companies the product manager is is also used as the scrum master as the uh, project manager as uh, a lot of other things but um I think it's a vital part of that discussion, um, especially since we were uh, speaking about methodologies in general. Uh, we touched on Scrum already, um, and we, we already mentioned kind of in the intro <clears throat> that Scrum isn't necessarily uh, the best for everyone. Um, there's better ways we found out uh, over the past years. Um, what's your what's your favorite? What do you like here, and, and why and when? Yeah, no, that's that's uh, yeah. We talk, we touched on this one also pre just just before we started the the, the call. But um, I think this one is interesting. I think in my opinion, um, I think people are always looking for hacks. They're always looking for shortcuts, right? It's just in the human nature. We're lazy. We're always trying to find something easier to do. And I think what happened with Scrum is just like. We came up with one methodologies, a methodology that kind of worked out for a lot of people. And we went very deep on this one, like many, many ways on how to run it, many, many ways on how to do planning, points, t-shirt sizing, many, many ways to distribute the roles, whether it's the PM or proper Scrum Master. Um, like we went very, very far, I think. And I think it, it worked and there are many companies for, for, for which it worked. And so it's pretty cool. But my feeling is that when you blankly follow uh, some rules like that, you tend to forget a little bit the first principles, which is why was Scrum uh, put in place in the first place, right? And in the first place, it was put into place so that uh, they are, there was going to be an efficient way of building things ultimately for people so that they can you know, solve some problems. And uh, I think Scrum is probably the best way we had so far. But I, my feeling is that we will refer to Scrum like, uh, you know, we are referring to Waterfall today in a couple of years. I think Scrum is, will be updated sometime soon. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think less than 10 years. I don't think Scrum will, will stick around for too long. Um, so yeah, so that's my thinking. Agile seems to be quite sticky though. Uh, Agile is a, is a very uh, bare bone uh, dogma. If you look at the uh, Agile manifesto online, it literally says like, I think it has 10 bullet points, something like that. And, um, and it's funny how people kind of reinterpret, you know, these points over time. Uh, I think, I think that, that's quite powerful, that, that may stick around a little bit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So going back to the roots a little bit, because uh, Scrum was supposed to kind of follow Agile and, and, and be Agile. Um, but what, what other trends have you seen emerge? So the one thing that I was really surprised was, so N26 and, Inter and Zalando were fully scrum, like classic playbook, uh, play, you know, planning poker, uh, velocity stuff, um, estimated everything. One thing that I've seen, uh, I've seen a lot is, um, there seem to be, um, a D, a, like, a lot of like a new school of product where people are moving away from the estimation. It seems that the estimation is the, you know, the beginning of a lot of uh, problems because if you want to estimate things, then you have to create some culture around estimating things. And then if things uh, are not properly estimated, it puts some extra pressure or you miss some, you know, targets and then you need to report or catch up yet, et cetera, et cetera. So I've seen, I've seen what Intercom started to do. I mean, they've always been like that. And obviously Basecamp is one of these uh, precursors in this domain. 
is stop doing uh, estimation. That, 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 that doesn't work, you're never gonna be right. And instead, try to kind of give yourself some time frame where you think you can push a significant piece of value for the users. So Basecamp has adopted the six week cycles, which is also adopted by Intercom. And, um, and I, think, I think there will be more and more companies uh, you know, following this path. I'm not sure if the six week cycle is the, the best uh, format necessarily, but what Basecamp is saying is that six weeks is like not too long, not too short, just enough so that you can anticipate and plan some project you want to push. And you're kind of like pretty sure that within this you know, month and a half, you're going to be able to fit a minimal version of, you know, quite ambitious project you have. And so then kind of like estimation doesn't really matter because you know that in six weeks you can make magic happen, right? And this kind of like, it's still very short, um, you know, deadline, which means that you still have to scope things out a lot if you want to make them work, but it's not like too, too strict, let's say. So that's one thing really, really important. I've, I've seen a lot of discussion around uh, estimation and um, I think there are many other stuff, but uh, I'll just pretty pause on this one and ask you uh, like any reaction, what do you think about this one? Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah, the, the, the base camp one is called Shape Up, uh, right? And um, so I'm doing six week cycles. Uh, I'm supposed to push something of value during this these six weeks. Um, when I think about a scrum sprint, the idea of the two weeks was always I should be pushing something of value during these two weeks. That was also the mantra. So within these six weeks, what do I do differently than, let's say, during a two week uh, scrum sprint? How what, how does my thinking differ, my actions? Yeah, so the it's it's kind of like the reality if you work with one week sprints or two week sprints is probably that you're not going to be able to push what you can push in six weeks, right? So the only difference is do you set a goal on a weekly or bi -week, like bi-weekly basis or do you set a goal and kind of like some targets and um, yeah, some things you want to push overall with a six weeks uh, timeline. And so what it does is just, it, what it does is just, it tells you like, I'm not going to set like one fraction of the feature as my goal, but rather I'm going to set the full feature as my goal, right? In six weeks. And what that means is that, you know, you have, as soon as you know that you have six weeks to make it happen, you're going to be a lot more um, smart about how you can rearrange this work within the six weeks to make it the more efficient. So like the one and two week cycle is like, we have six weeks, let's get with the most every piece and let's go through as fast as we can because next week we have the second piece we need to start. So we need to finish the first piece on time. Six weeks is like, we have six weeks, we have like five engineers. This is like, you know, 50 days of engineering time. How do we assemble the piece to get this thing out? And can we actually make less than six weeks? Like we said six weeks, but actually maybe we can do four. Like, is there a way to cut, cut this down? And so you start to think in a, in a very rich way and usually you find much better solutions. That's, that's my experience at least. And you also put less pressure on people to just achieve, you know, week to week uh, kind of targets. Yeah, I, I guess the key is not to think uh, problems, solutions, tickets, oh, how many of those fit into a sprint as it is with, with Scrum, but uh, problems, six weeks, how can I solve that? Uh, and then the feature kind of is the end product of, of, of this thinking. I mean, within Basecamp's shape up, you, you, you're even divided into phases, right? Where you have the shaping up phase first, you say, hey, here's just my problem definition. Guys, what can we do? Um, and then you only have the implementation phase, at which point you already know what can we even do in these four or five weeks or the left. Um, so that, that definitely is, is a very fascinating mindset shift, but it just makes sense. It just makes so much sense. Like I'll give you an example. When I started at Intercom, we had this beautiful roadmap for one quarter. So we planned two week, two cycles. Um, and I had these like three items on my roadmap for the next cycle. They were prioritized aligned with my, you know, head of product and so on. And we were like, okay, let's, let's do them. Like, that's clear. We should do them. 
And one of them, which was initially estimated in my roadmap for two weeks, turned out to be a one day task. So there was this one thing I thought uh, we could do a solution in the product and someone came up with a, a video and say, oh, can't, can't we just add, ask customer success to do a video? And we put the video here and people can play the video and you know, it solves the problem. Like, you know, it's just solves the problem. And we ended up doing that. And that was kind of like really troublesome for me at the time because I didn't plan enough items in the roadmap to move, for, you know, to, move to an another one. But actually what happened that day, and the team knew it, but I didn't know it, was that we have had used our resources as a company in a much more efficient way, and we would have progressed much faster uh, along our roadmap. And that was the best decision to do. So um, yeah, thinking first principle, leaving some doors open to you know what's the best way to solve the problem and what's the timeline to solve the problem uh, is usually um, quite a powerful surprisingly powerful mm -hmm, mm -hmm, 100% uh, how, how big is your team at, at June right now so we're a team of uh, three right now we're still, uh, nice. still a baby company and we are uh, nice. we're doubling the we're doubling the count in the coming uh, three months awesome that's very good um, and how how does a soft your software development process look like within this small early stage company how do you run your product team at that stage? It's so interesting because I was, I was, uh, it's, it's really interesting now that we've had this conversation about how others do and how we do it. I think one of the things we've had, uh, Ferruccio, my co-founder and I, when we started was we also wanted to build a very opinionated approach uh, to product development because uh, we're really passionate about this space. And so we thought, okay, how can we do it differently? I think the one thing that, um, we do pretty aligned with Intercom is the six weeks uh, cycle together with a, work, a weekly planning. It's not because you have a six week cycle that you don't reflect every week whether you're on track and where you're going next week, right? So this, this we've completely kept it. Uh, we've also adopted OKRs, which is very common in large companies. I think the main difference for us is that we've, uh, we've uh, mapped our OKRs at a cycle uh, frequency. So we have cycle OKRs and uh and we only have one just because in a startup if you start you have like 10 okrs you just lose you know track of what you should be going after so that's our kind of like the high level metrics and kind of the goals and then when it comes into product development i think we're extremely lean we, we tend to remove a lot of tools if we can so we are doing uh really really quick uh, spec product spec uh usually in a notion doc or in a google doc and then uh, we open to many, many conversation from the team. So we tend to challenge the assumption and uh, what we're going after. The prioritization is usually done um, asynchronous, asynchronously. We, talk to, we tend to talk about like a lot of problems. We have very shared understanding about what are the customer's problems because we have like lots of channels in Slack where they share feedback with us. And so kind of like, we tend to skip a little bit the prioritization exercise just because uh, customers are so noisy with us, uh, so loud with us that people tend to know exactly what is the next priority. So usually it's not like, what should we do next? And we are not really convinced. It's like, okay, there are like three urgent things. Which one is the most urgent? So we do this uh, prioritization exercise on the fly and, as and asynchronously during the planning exercise. Then uh, what happens is we do a very short design exploration usually less than a week for any things we want to push. Um, I tend to align on the spec with our designers and then our designer will share again in Slack all the exploration that he has done. This is something that actually Intercom was doing really well, which was that every time you do an exploration at Intercom, a design exploration, you share it with the entire company and the entire company can, can comment on your design even if they are not in your team, even if they are not product people. Like a salesperson that is new can comment the design of a very senior product designer at Intercom. And this is amazing because as soon as you open for feedback, you get very, very rich feedbacks and very rich ideas. You also have the founders that jump sometime in, into the topic. So we, we kept that, we just love it. So um, the, 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 the design are, share, are shared in our Slack. And we have actually emojis and we can vote with emojis on our favorite design 
if there are like like three options, we can just vote with with design with the emojis. So we don't open endless debates like you know if there is more uh, emojis on one version, we just go for it. And of course, we can open thread on Slack if we have any comments. And then when this that is done, is... Uh, it goes into a scoping uh, decision, which is usually driven by the engineers. That is very interesting. My, my first reaction when I heard you say this was like, why, why would you do that? You know, too many cooks, uh, it, it, you know, everybody has an opinion on design and they're likely unqualified. But then again, uh, you sometimes use applications and you wonder, you know, how, you know, this is so stupid. How could they make this UX mistake? Like, I don't know what this is about. And that happens because someone was looking at a very isolated feature uh, mm -hmm. was applying their best knowledge to it, which is they had no idea about the context that uh, a user would be in coming directly from sign up, for example, or just not thinking about it. And here, somebody can really, from various perspectives, give feedback. So I really like that. It's really nice. It's really nice. It's one of the really cool things that uh, Intercom was doing. I love it. That's awesome. And um, now, uh, if for, for just a few minutes because we're, we're slowly running out of time because it's such an interesting conversation. But um, are you guys remote first? Yes, we are. We are. Um, there, it was the first time we kind of like went into a full remote setup. We used to be uh, working in companies with an uh, office. Of course, with the COVID crisis, uh, we moved to a, a remote setup. But it was kind of a remote friendly setup, right? Until, until like kind of the world would go back to normal. With June, we've decided to embrace the remote first setup. Um, and I think what we've found out is that um, you need to be extremely, you need to invest a lot in your process because, uh, you know, uh, you need to, like, human nature needs some kind of like personal bonds and, and so on. And it's easy to feel disconnected from people when you're, you don't see them every week, right? So uh, we are trying to invest a lot into that. The other thing is uh, we are looking into some uh, a retreat format in the coming uh, in the coming weeks, so that basically you know the team has a like the opportunity to meet in person. I think over time the most in inspiring company in my opinion right now regarding remote is uh, is Dropbox. They have something they call the studios, which is basically that they they have places around the world where people can gather on uh, a voluntary basis. So let's say you're in New York, you, you work from home, and you really, really want to see your colleagues from Dropbox. Then once a week, Dropbox has this amazing studio, the, the rent, and you can go there and there is like, you know, it's not compulsory, you can just go there if you miss your personal, you know, connections. And uh, I like it. I think this kind of hybrid model where you can, you know, be remote when you want, or you can meet people in person when you actually want. Uh, on a voluntary basis. I think that's really, really strong. So as we scale, uh, most likely this is the format we're going to lean uh, for. I love it. That, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, now, to, to wrap this up, um, if people want to learn more about product management, the thinking behind that, the, the mindset, the, the methodologies, um, what should they learn first? And do you have any resources on hand that would help? Yeah, so I think I started with Intercom to be to be frank. Uh, so I would say um, going with um, with the first uh, ebook that Intercom published on product management, which is called Intercom on Product Management. I think that's a really really good uh, basis. I think it's really approachable. Uh, it's really short, very digestible. Um, and it's, 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 it's good basics because it's like first principle. So I would really, really advocate to do that. And it was written by, by the founders of Intercom who are amazing people. Um, so this is kind of my Bible, I would say to start. Then, um, then there are many books, which are great. I think one of the, one of which I really love was called uh, product leadership, uh, by, er um, Mr. Erickson, I forgot his name. Um, the, the, the dude who created, um, you know, um, product management, um, the product management conference. I also forgot the name of this one. The, the most famous one on, uh, it's not on product. It's called, yeah, it's, it's extremely famous. It's extremely famous. So basically this book is really important. Uh, product leadership is really important to read early on. 
to understand that your role as a product manager is not to manage. And this is one of the first things you need to understand, and this is one of the most classic mistakes you do when you get started, which is you try, you think you're the like mini CEO you know, of the company, and usually it doesn't work really, really well. So that one is really important. They are, I think what Basecamp did is amazing. I think Shape Up is a good book. I don't think it's the best they have written. Actually, they wrote a few ones before that. And uh, they, uh, they, they wrote one very early on called Getting Real. Getting Real is, a, I think, magnificent adapt, adaptation of uh, the Agile Manifesto into building software. It's quite old, but it's extremely relevant. And honestly, I don't think they, they've written any better book since Getting Real. And then if you, I think one last book I would recommend, if for any reason you're joining a company who is very strict with Agile and Scrum, and you need to catch up with these things really quickly, then there is a handbook called Agile Product Management with Scrum. It's written by, um, it's written by our friend uh, Roman Pitchler. And it's just like a very good summary of what is a backlog, what is a sprint, uh, how you do all this stuff when you have no clue how they work. And it's kind of like a cheat sheet. Like you can read that in two weeks, you are uh, up to speed with you know, the way that many, many companies work out there. So that's very helpful. And one last question. Um, a lot of people, um, a lot of CEOs of, of growing software companies, um, they decide that they don't want to learn it themselves. They also don't don't have the time to do that. They want to focus on fundraising, sales, marketing, strat strategy, uh, and they want to hire a product manager. But without really knowing, or without being a product manager, what are the biggest mistakes, or what should somebody watch out for when hiring a product manager? Because I've seen myself, we, we sometimes recruit product managers for our clients. There's a, unlike developers, there's a lot of applicants. So the problem is you need to understand who's the right fit. It's a it's a it's a hard one because I think in our situation, since I'm like a founder with a product management background, we would probably we will probably delay this uh, recruitment just because we have this uh, um, oh, of course skills in house. So for me, this, pro this question is especially hard. How do you recruit a first PM is hard, but when you have already some of the skills in house, it's ex especially hard because you need to justify that. I think I, think I can just reflect on my first experience. Uh, so maybe your, your friend actually who was head of product uh, at 1026 is actually the person who recruited me. And so reflecting on that, on why I was given a shot. So I didn't start as a PM, I started as an associate PM, right? Or something like that. Um, but nevertheless, you need to be given a chance at some point, right? I think for me, um, I think what they were looking for is someone with a strong enough background in one of the three input I shared with you. So strategy, data, or customers, uh, customers uh, like being able to talk to the, to the users. Either you have some kind of background in research a little bit, or you've done some surveys, you know how this works, maybe you have a bit of a, a design or research background or a bit of marketing background and you really are passionate about tech. You may be a very strong person to run these, you know, these interviews and be very customer centric. Or in my case, I was kind of like pretty good with data. And so uh, they were kind of confident that I could you know, justify probably some of the decisions or the ideas that I had with data. And actually, I'm gonna drop the last one, which is strategy. I think when you're an early stage recruit uh, team person in a large in a company, I don't think people care too much about your vision <laughs> or your strategy. Uh, I think it's way too early for you. So um, yeah, I wouldn't recruit. I wouldn't say like being a visionary or a very, a very strong strategy skills is important for an early stage uh, recruitment, an early, an early recruitment in a startup. It's a very hard role to recruit for. I don't know how you do it. And it, it, that's super interesting because that it shows precisely what the thinking out there is. Because you, uh, one thing that you did not mention right, rightfully so, is uh, <laughs> being able to, you know, write technical documentation and manage developers and run sprints, which is what 
actually most founders want when they are looking for a product manager and funnily enough what most applicants pitch when they apply for a product management role uh, which is very funny because you, you, you are looking for in theory you know you need someone to help make better product decisions uh, but in the end it, it, it boils down to hiring a project manager which 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 is a mistake somewhat um, well thank you so much for 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 joining us today how can we learn more about June learn more about you um, Thanks for having me, Victor. I really, really appreciate the time and, and the, the conversation was, was good fun. Uh, the best place to learn about me is probably Twitter. I try to be quite active. So you just take my first name, Enzo, E-N-Z-O, and you put it in the other way around. So it's like Ozn, Ozni, and you replace the O with a, a zero. Uh, because we're, the, we're definitely going to write that out in the show notes. <laughs> The, the other one was taken. Uh, that's the best way to learn from me. And actually, um, yeah, if you follow me on Twitter, you're going to see the journey of, of June. Um, so, um, yeah, you could just follow my PO or my tweet, whatever. Or if you want to have a look without following me, which is totally fine, uh, the website is june.so. It's, uh, yeah, an analytics, a no-code analytics for startups. Amazing. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to have you. Thanks, Victor. Talk soon.